Okay, good morning and, and welcome to the third meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Just remind everyone, if I may, please, to switch off your mobile telephones as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, obviously, as, as the papers come in a digital format, it's, it's perfectly all right to use the, uh, your uh, laptops to, to read those. We've received apologies from uh, Stuart Stevenson, who has to be away on personal business. Uh, I would also like, at this stage, if I may, please, to uh, mention that Emma Harper has stepped down from the committee and I'd like to thank her for her work on the committee, albeit very short time. She was extremely diligent in responding and, and taking an interest in the business of the committee, so I would like to thank her for that. And I'd like to welcome our new member, Mario Evans, to the committee, and in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct, I'd like you to ask you to declare any interests you have relevant to the committee's remit. Uh, I declared an interest in that I'm a councillor for Angus Council. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very simple. Um, so, fourth, replacing, uh, fourth replacement crossing. If I could ask uh, the team that have come in, uh, David Climey, thank you for coming, and Lawrence Shackman for coming in, thank you very much. I'd like to ask David if you would like to make an opening statement to the committee. Certainly, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, following my brief appearance uh, with the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, at the end of June, uh, I'm conscious that this is our first detailed engagement with the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee uh, to provide an update on the fourth replacement crossing project. And so perhaps a, a very brief introduction is appropriate. I'm David Climey, uh, Project Director for Transport Scotland and the Employer's Representative for Scottish Ministers on the FRC project, a role which I've held since June 2010 having spent the previous 27 years working for contractors on major bridge and infrastructure projects around the world. My colleague, Lawrence Shackman, is Project Manager for Transport Scotland and Deputy Employers Representative, and he's held this position since 2006, so he's really been with the project since day one. On the 8th of June this year, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Fair Work and Jobs advised Parliament that the opening to traffic date for the Queen's Ferry Crossing would be May 2017, and that the project will continue to be delivered within the current budget range of 1.325 to 1.35 billion pounds. I'm pleased to confirm that this remains the case today. I would like to emphasize that reaching the finishing line on this project remains challenging, particularly with the weather, and that neither the contractor FCBC nor I are under any illusion about that. However, I can assure you that everything that can safely be done is being done on the project to achieve the earliest possible opening date. The site workforce has averaged 1,196 people in the past 12 months, with a peak of over 1,300 in the spring. The highly visible progress that is being made on site is a tribute to the significant efforts of the site team, which continues to meet the challenges that arise in construction work of this size and technical complexity in often challenging environmental conditions. I look forward to welcoming committee members to the site in the near future, to meet some of the dedicated workforce and to see the scale of the works at close quarters for yourselves. So focusing on progress on the principal contract recently, on the south side, the new northbound mainline carriageway is ready for traffic from the Scotston Junction to the new Queen's Ferry Junction with signage, ITS gantries, white lining and road, li and road lighting. The new southbound carriageway will receive its final surfacing in the coming weeks. Both the northbound and southbound public transport links are also nearing completion. Over the past two weekends, road closures have, taken, have been in place on the A90 and the M90 spur overnight from Saturday to Sunday to install the large sign gantries across the carriageways at Scotston. On the Queen's Ferry crossing itself, the first deck unit was lifted into place at the North Tower on the 7th of September last year, exactly one year ago. 93 of the 110 deck units have now been lifted into place, leaving just 17 to go before the end of this year. The first deck closure between the North Approach Viaduct and the North Deck Fan was closed on the 19th of July and fitted very well. In the Marine Yard in Rosyth, all 110 steel deck units have been delivered and the last one had its concrete deck cast in place on the 12th of August. They have all been fitted out with internal walkways and in in initial mechanical and electrical works. On the viaducts, the installation of the concrete deck on the South Approach Viaduct is progressing northwards from the south abutment with 22 out of a total of 42 concrete pours required having been completed. 
On the north side, nine out of the 12 concrete deck pours required have been completed, and these are progressing to keep in balance with the lifting of deck units on the south side of the North Tower. On the north side roadworks, the ferry toll viaduct is structurally complete and has been waterproofed and is currently having the road surfacing installed. This area also has wind shielding on the western side, similar to that to be used on the Queen's Ferry crossing, and installation of this will start shortly. Work on the bridges to carry the southbound M90 across the new ferry toll junction has been completed, and the final layout of the new roundabout is clearly taking shape. Significant work has also progressed on Hope Street and in Vakeeling, and both King Malcolm Drive and Castle and Hill Road in Rosyth. Community relations continue to be extremely good, and the level of interest and excitement around the opening of the bridge is clearly increasing. The Contact and Education Centre continues to be the focus of our public engagement programme, and to date we have hosted over 15,000 school pupils, presented to groups from over 27 different countries, and over 59,000 people have attended a presentation on the project. In addition, the project team members have made presentations all around Scotland and elsewhere in the UK and Ireland to describe the remarkable work that is being undertaken on the project. The project has a significant digital media presence with around 50,000 people looking at the project website every month and an ever-growing audience on social media looking at time-lapse videos and drone footage of the, pro of the progress. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the, a fairly in-depth brief. Thank you. I think the first question is going to come from Mike. It, Mike, if you'd like to lead on that, please. So, so, thank you, convener. Um, yes, sounds very good progress indeed, but I would like to focus on the budget. In your letter to us, you said that um, the revised target date for opening has no impact on the budget, and the project is still within the reduced budget range of 100, up to, to £1.35 billion. Pounds. But my question really focuses on that figure, because in the Parliament's own information service, research service to us, I'm quite clear when it says the major um, contract was awarded to fourth crossing bridge constructors at 790 million. The Associated Intelligent Transport System was awarded to John Graham uh, Limited on, of 12.9 million. Uh, the third one was uh, to upgrade the junction 1A on the M9 uh, was awarded at 25.6 million. And the, and the, and the, as I say, the fourth, the whole thing uh, is budgeted at 1.35 billion. Those projects, the main contracts, add up to 828 million. And I wondered whether you could tell me, or the committee, where the other half of the money has gone. <laughs> Certainly, yes. Uh, now, this has been very transparent from, from day one on the project. Um, a lot of detail has, has been put into the public domain about this, and we are a separate budget line within the Scottish Government budget, of course. Um, the key elements that are involved in the budget are exactly, as you said, the three con main construction contracts. On top of that, there is non-recoverable VAT, there is inflation, there is risk and optimism bias, and the 1.35 billion, um, we're very clear that this covers the entirety of the project. So it's everything from when the project was first started to be scoped in 2007, right through until the end of the five year, year maintenance period in 2022. So it includes all the, the land purchase, uh, any compensation that has to be paid, all the initial design that had to be carried out, all the initial uh, environmental uh, investigations and so on. So it's, it's literally everything over a, uh, in fact, a 15 year period from 2007 when the project first started through until 2022 when the five year maintenance period is completed. So it really covers absolutely everything, uh, not just the construction contracts themselves. Could I, could I ask, would it be very helpful for the committee if you could possibly um, put that in writing to us, the detail, because I'm really, I, I do, when the main contracts are up to 828 million and the budget is 1.35 billion, there's a heck of a lot of money missing there. And, and I just it may not be missing, but it's missing in, you know, in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. So I want to know really, right down to the nitty gritty, where that budget line has, sure. has gone. I, I, I think you helpful. might also find it helpful to look at there was an audit Scotland report on, mm -hmm. on five major um, projects within Scotland that was um, prepared in 2014. And that did ex exactly what you've just described. It went through exactly where all the money is. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy to give you a link to that uh, report and also to provide you an update on just how things have moved since my, then. My last comment on it, all I wanted to, to ask really was, um, it's just remarkable that there's these months of delay and yet it doesn't cost any more money because of the contract, which 
I have to say, in my own mind, as a layman on, on all of this, begs the question of whether the contract was over-egged in the first place. That's the point I was wanting to make. No comment on that. I'm quite happy to provide you with all the numbers. <laughs> I say I think it covers a much broader range of, of elements than, than <coughs> you, you, you yeah. perhaps appreciate. The, the detail will be and appreciated. The detail will, I think you'll find extremely helpful in Absolutely. just where all the money is allocated because it does cover a very, very wide range of things in addition to the, the, the main construction contracts themselves. Thank you. Okay. David, I think, I think it would be useful for us to have that broken down. I think it would also be useful for us to know that when the last payment is made, in the sense that under uh, compulsory purchase orders, there is compensation due for road noise and any change of effects to properties for a period up and after the end of the contract. So it would be interesting, I think, from the committee to know that when this is signed off, the date, it will be signed off for all claims for compensation as well, and that those have been allowed for. Certainly, we can, we'll include some detail on that in the information we submit to you, yes, because it, obviously it does go on for a period afterwards, you're quite correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Ro Rhoda, I think you have a... Yes, thank you. Um, given um, completion was to be December and because of weather it's been pushed back to May, are you confident that it will be completed in May next year? I'm as confident as I can be that it will be, be open uh, in May of next year, yes. Um, we've, had a, we've had a good three months. The progress um, has been extremely good. Um, but as I've said, we've made good progress on uh, erecting the deck units. There are now 17 left to go. Um, we've overcome the first closure between the, the North Approach Viaduct and the North Deck Fan, which was an area, um, one of the only two areas on the project where the deck units had not been pre-fitted together to make sure that they did fit, uh, and they did fit extremely well. So we've gone through that exercise. That's another risk that, that, that has passed. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the weather is always going to be there and it will always be an issue. Um, the progress we're making at the moment is very much in line with achieving the, the May date. Um, and we're, we're doing a lot of work to look at, once we finish lifting the deck units at the end of the year, the following activities that, come, that uh, go off on after that, uh, which are things like removing the tower cranes, uh, putting the waterproofing and the deck surfacing on the deck, making sure we take every opportunity to do those whenever we can. Although obviously January, February, March is not the ideal time to be doing those sort of things. But the programme that we have now allows sufficient time for those things to be done. So I'm, I have reasonable confidence that we'll meet May, yes. Okay. So what's your, I suppose, I'm asking what's your best and what's your worst scenario? Um, you know, if, if everything goes swimmingly, are you going to be ahead of me? If things don't, how far back could it slip? Well, I suppose, given that I'm, I'm always an optimist, yes, I always hope it will be before me, uh, but I'm also a realist and I accept that there's, there's certain circumstances it could be after me. But I think, I, I, I think at this moment it's not particularly helpful to speculate where it could end up, because I say that the main issue that could affect it, which is something we cannot control, is the weather. Um, so I think May is a, a very reasonable assumption and that's certainly what we're, we're aiming for. And we believe we can achieve, and the contractor believes they can achieve, and that's what they're telling us they can achieve. Okay, so it could be ahead of me then, is what you're saying, because maybe your worst case is me. There is always that possibility. <laughs> David, can I push you a little bit on, on, on this, uh, the timescale, and, and perhaps you can help me. Uh, up until February this, uh, this last year, you was, uh, sorry, this year, you stated the weather had been favourable, allowing additional work to be carried out. I think that actually you said the good weather outweighed the bad weather allowing 24-hour working and for us to, put, to push forward. We are confident that it will be open in December of this year. Barely three months later, you've changed that to saying 40% of the time had been downtime rather than the 25% that had been forecast. So on the basis that you were pushing ahead up until February and you were ahead of schedule by what you said to the committee in February, how come that barely three months later we have gone back so far when you're only saying that there have been a change of 15% in the downtime that you were forecasting. I mean, to me, that doesn't seem right. Perhaps you could explain that to me, David. Certainly, yeah. I think I'm not quite sure where you're getting the, the February appearance from. Um, I, appeared, I appeared in... It's your report uh, that, that you put forward. Oh, a written report. Sorry, yes. I beg your pardon. Because certainly in the, the appearance in front of the committee in September of 2015 and the appearance in March of 2016, uh, we explored this in a quite a great deal of detail. 
in terms of what, what was possible and what was not possible. And in September 2015, I said that we, we needed a, an average winter. That was what we needed at that point to get to December 2016 opening. Uh, when I came to the committee in, in March of 2016, I said we'd had a, a worse than average winter. I said we were not where we'd hoped to be, but we still believed at that point, and the contractor believed at that point, that we could still achieve it. So I, I made it very clear that weather was a challenge, that it continued to be a challenge, and that we'd not had the winter that we'd hoped for when I, when I explained to the committee in March of 2015. It's 2016, I beg your pardon. Um, since then, in, in, in April and May, um, I think it was, it was reasonable in, in, at the beginning of March for the contractor to expect that the weather was going to improve, that we would actually get into a better period of weather, and that even though they were behind where they wanted to be, they could recover to still get there by December. What happened in April and May was exactly the contrary of that. It was significantly worse than they'd expected, and therefore, rather than recovering time, they were actually losing time. And realistically, you do get to a point where um, if, if, you've got, if you're trying to recover, say, one month in 10, then that is a realistic possibility in terms of a major construction project. If you get to the point where you're trying to recover two months in seven, that really is not realistic anymore. And you have to say, right, we've, we've given it our best shot, we've thrown everything at it that we can, and we now have to say, sorry, we just aren't going to get there. And the key is that if you, if you don't make December, that then pushes you effectively significantly into 2017 because you cannot at that point say it's only just going to be into 2017 because the weather's going to be fine. It, it just, that just is not realistic. The knock-on effect of losing time in April and May has, an, has a multiplying effect going into January and February. So therefore, a day lost in April or May is not equivalent to a day in January or February. So there's a, a multiplication factor involved in that. And that's where we are today. My, my problem is it still doesn't... I understand the multiplication factor, but what you were saying up until uh, that report is that you were ahead of schedule and, and that you'd had significantly more. Uh, in fact, outweighing the bad time was good times, and you, you had 24-hour working, which you hadn't been working on. What I can't get my mind around, and I don't think a lot of other people can get their mind around, is how, having been so far ahead and being so confident at the beginning of the year, that shortly after uh, we have a, a change in, in the Parliament, that it suddenly dropped back so far. And I think it's a reasonable question, because that's what, what people feel out there. You said you're ahead, you're now behind in a period of three months, you've lost 15%, but it doesn't, it seems more than 15% in time. So well, if I, I explain that... What, what, well, as I say, I, I, I was challenged on this in great detail at two committee hearings in September and March. And in March, I certainly did not say we were ahead. I, I said we were behind where we wanted to be when I came to the committee in March. And I went through that in a lot of detail as to why we were behind in March, because the weather had certainly been in November and December had not been good. And in, in January, that had continued. We did get a good spill of, of weather in March, but it, that went downhill again in April and May. So I think in terms of what I've told to the, the committees of this parliament, I've been absolutely straightforward and, and factual in what I've told them. Mm, I'm still struggling to understand. I know Gail wants to ask a question on, on the same thing, so maybe her question will help enlighten me. Um, well, I don't know if it will. I think that what we need to keep sight of here is that the, the, the bridge is not behind schedule. The bridge was always due to be completed in June of next year, and opening in May, I think, will be a good result. Um, and, and, you know, well done for getting it all back on track. We can't predict the weather. Well, maybe the Met Office can to a certain extent, but in April and May, you're right, you know, things. And, and we've all read the report about how absolutely precise this has to be. Um, my question is on the workforce and the weather conditions. You were doing 24-hour shifts. If the weather suddenly um, goes, takes a downturn, <laughs> What happens to these workers that were supposed to be on shift for if you had predicted good weather and vice versa, if uh, we do get an unseasonably good winter and you're able to push on and, and bring the date forward, where do you get that workforce in from? Are they on standby? Are they work? You know what I mean? Is it's, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, I understand exactly your question, yes. Um, we're very fortunate, as I mentioned earlier, and that we do have a very flexible workforce. Um, they, 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 the construction industry is inherently one where you have to have flexible working in that you have to be able to react to exactly these sort of situations. 
Um, for example, we have some particularly large concrete pours that have to be done. And once you start a concrete pour, that concrete pour has to be finished. And it might take 12 hours to do. We had a number of occasions where we've had um, the conditions have been windy, we've had a deck unit on a barge, we've taken it out into the fourth and it sat there waiting for the wind to die down because the Met Office has predicted there's a, a lull coming in the wind and that, that lull hasn't come and therefore they've had to, to, to wait all day, the lull hasn't come so it's gone back into the, the uh, yard in Rosyth and they had to go back out again next day. Uh, I think the worst case we've had of that is one that went out three days in a row and then finally we managed to, to get the deck lifted. Uh, the other side of that coin is that they are available so that yesterday, for example, we lifted two debt units in a day. The people are there and they're able to do the work. If the conditions are favourable, which yesterday was a great day, two debt units went up in a day. And we've managed to do that, I think, on seven occasions uh, so far. But there'll be other days when it's incredibly frustrating and they're sat there waiting to do things and they just, they just can't do it. But certainly FCBC has done a great deal in terms of how they work with their labour and how flexible the approach is with the labour so that there are times when they, when they come into work and they aren't able to work. Obviously they still have to be paid and they are paid. Um, there are other occasions when they agree to work on longer to complete an operation that's already been started. So I think it's very important that we have that flexibility of, of workforce to achieve uh, what we need to achieve. Thank you. Richard, do you want to ask that? Yeah. You actually touched on the point I was going to ask. Wind variation. I was on the, the M8, as uh, construction has been done in my area, I was on a bridge on the M8 last week and, and not very high up, and I felt the wind. Now, how high are you on the bridge uh, for the wind variation? And that surely affects your whether you can lift a deck and put it in place, etc. So, how high, high are you up? And, um, as there occasions, even on a sunny day, uh, as it was last week when I was in the, this bridge in the M8, uh, that wind variation can affect your, your work. It's absolutely fundamental to everything we do, you're quite right. Um, it was one of the things we brought out in the technical briefing that we did for, for MSPs um, following the, the announcement of the change in the date. Um, the, basically, the, the Met Office always gives wind speeds at ground level. Um, the, deck, the, the deck on the bridge is at about 60 metres in height. By the time you get up 60 metres, you can increase that wind by 50% from what's being given at ground level. The cable work that we're doing at the moment is done in, in man baskets on either side of the tower. That's currently at a height of about 180 metres. By the time you get up to that level, you've got a factor of 90 to 100% increase from the wind at, at deck level, at, at uh, ground level. Um, I think what was, what was quite interesting was we had a, a visit from the, the Cabinet Secretary came out on the 12th of August, which looked as if it was going to be a nice day. And we had the BBC and STV with us at just at deck level. And there the wind was blowing about 40 miles an hour. And they, they were able to go around and see which activities were able to proceed with the wind at that speed and also to understand just what it was like. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think if the committee members come to visit the site, uh, we'll give, them, give you the opportunity to, to come out and see just how different conditions can be at ground level and deck level. I think, thank you for that offer, and I think we, we, we have got a provisional date that we're going to discuss after this, this meeting to come out of sight. Uh, John, could, could you? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, can I thank you for the opportunity to visit in July, uh, which I really appreciated and gave me a much better understanding. Uh, so I think, I think it reassured me on a number of questions that I might have asked. I mean, given that you, the last time you were at the committee was in March, can you tell us just what have been the main things that have happened, the kind of key things? I think you mentioned the first closure, so I take it that was a key step in the last kind of six months. Absolutely, yes, it was. Yeah, and that was, that was probably, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, if you like, the highest risk elements that we had because we were effectively matching together two deck sections there which had never been matched together before because the, the north approach viaduct, that was effectively assembled as a kit of parts on the approach road on the north side, um, just behind the abutment, and it was launched out into position during February and March of this year. Um, and that was matched to the deck that was building out from the towers, where the deck segment had had the concrete put onto it in the yard in Rosyth. So therefore, you're, you're putting two sections together that had never, ever been matched together before. Every other section on the job had been match fitted previously, so we knew it would fit together exactly. Um, when we put, brought them together, it actually fitted extremely well. We were very pleased with the way that, that joint went, um, so that was extremely good. Um, what has also happened, of course, is in that area, the, the deck lifting is now finished because we are connected to the North Approach Viaduct, so the deck lifting gantry that was in that area has now been taken away. Um, a point that we're just coming up to, which is probably worth mentioning, is that the, the centre tower fan 
Uh, we lifted a deck unit yesterday, which was the, the 19th deck unit, and by the next week we'll have lifted the last one at the other end as well. At that point, we'll actually have the longest freestanding balanced cantilever that's ever been constructed in the world. It will be over 630 metres long. So from the, from the centre tower, there'll be 320 metres either side uh, there, waiting for the, the connections to, to either side. That's all balanced and hanging on that one tower? It is, yes. Yes. Is there a risk in that? The, 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 <laughs> I'll be careful how I, how I express this. Um, yes, there is a risk, but it's one that has been very carefully engineered, right. and it's been made sure that everything has been taken account of in terms of were we to get the 100-year storm coming along while we're in that condition, it's been designed to take that loading. Yes. And that's actually the greatest loading that that particular tower will ever see once mm -hmm. the, the, the ends are joined to the, the, the yes, South yes. Tower and the North Tower. Yes. It, it becomes a much more rigid structure. Yes. And perhaps the other thing I should mention, and I'm sure people will have observed it, is that structure itself is extremely flexible. When we lift a deck unit at one end, that's 750 tonnes being lifted into place 320 metres out from the tower. Now, the tower itself is 200 metres high, and the only fixed point on that tower is at the base of it. So you have a tower that can, can flex backwards and forwards by about a metre and a half at the top. You have a 320 metre cantilever, and you're putting 750 tonnes at the end of it. So if you'd looked at it yesterday morning, the fan from the centre tower and the fan from the south tower pretty much aligned. If you look at it today, the, the centre tower fan is down by about two and a half metres. Right. So there's a significant step there. When we put the balancing unit onto the other end next week, you'll see them come better into line, but they will still be out of line. We then attach the two cables to the tower, and that pulls them up to their correct level. So I would emphasise that for anyone looking at the bridge in the next three months between now and getting the last deck units in, it will move around like that. It's supposed to move around like that. We take very careful monitoring of the loads in the cables and the physical movement of the deck, and it's all behaving exactly as predicted by the designers. So please be reassured by that. It's, it is expected to move, and it will move. Right. Well, we do to get comments from the public about that sort of thing, because they're a bit concerned that it's not going to match up. But, right. Uh, have confidence. <laughs> have you had feedback from the public on, on that kind of... Yes, we have, yes. Yeah, to get the right. uh, letter or email. OK, well, that's reassuring. Um, the, uh, and based on what you've just said, I mean, is, that, is, is it the case then that, you know, even if you were to double the workforce, you couldn't actually go faster because you've got to put the unit in before you put the cable in kind of thing? It's a very sequential series of operations. Um, basically, you lift up the deck unit, once the deck unit is up in, in position, you have to, to weld the, the steelwork on the outside of it. You have to bolt the steelwork. At that point, there's a, a stitch in the concrete deck that has to be concreted. Once that is complete, you can then install the cables, exactly as you describe. Mm -hmm. It's about a three-day operation to install the cables and all the strands. You then take the load of the deck unit into those cables. And at that point, you can release the, the lifting gantry. So it's very much a, a cyclic operation. And particularly with the, with the cabling work, it's a very small area where you can actually work. So you're, you're right, throwing extra labour at it doesn't actually achieve anything. Okay. And what will also happen going forward is that the number of work fronts that we have between now and the completion of deck lifting will actually decrease. Because, as I said, we've lifted the last deck unit on the south of the centre tower. So the next thing that happens will be, will be that we'll dismantle that blue deck lifting gantry. Next week, we'll finish the last one on the centre tower to the north and then we'll dismantle that deck lifting gantry. So that effectively takes away two work fronts from, from the activities. Right. And what are the other, I mean, the, <coughs> the getting the units in and the closure, are, the, are they the main kind of steps or uh, uh, risks, if you like, um, over the next few months? Uh, is there anything else that's kind of uh, important or risky or key? Those are, the, those are the key things and the most visible things. I mean, obviously, yes. the road works either side, they're, they're progressing and they'll continue to progress. And I think people will, mm -hmm. will be seeing those as they're, as they're driving through the scheme. But everything there is, is progressing well off the critical path. And there's nothing there that would impact on the opening date in terms of, of the roads. Mm -hmm. uh, with the bridge itself, um, there are certain activities that we cannot start until we actually have the bridge connected from end to end. And that's things like putting the windshielding on. Because the windshielding, excuse me, is about three metres high. And the whole idea is that deflects the wind up and over the road itself. So it takes quite a lot of load. Mm -hmm. So until we have a continuous structure from end to end, we don't want to be putting additional wind load onto the structure itself. So that needs a fully complete structure from end to end before that windshielding can be installed. Mm -hmm. um, also, we have to put on the, the waterproofing, the road surfacing, which, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at doing those in the, the, uh, the winter, which is not the ideal time. 
Um, so it's not, it's not a risk, it's just the fact that there will be less opportunity to do it than would be ideal. So if the weather was bad, you can't put on the road surface? Yes, but in a different way. It's not so much wind affected, it's more temperature. We don't want low temperatures, clearly we don't want snow. Um, so those, those aspects would then come into play. Um, but by the same token, we'll be gearing up so that we can really go at it and put a lot down when we do get the opportunities. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, Jamie, uh, sorry, anything else on that? Jamie, I think you were next. Um. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for that update. Um, I, I really don't want to dwell on the, uh, the time scale issue too much. I appreciate that um, weather plays such an important part in a, something of the scale and size, but I just feel that there's an overarching feeling amongst us that for a 1.3 billion project to say that, well, it really all just comes down to the weather just feels quite loose. Uh, I, 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 is, it, is it the case that we should be assuming the worst and then being pleasantly surprised rather than hoping for the best, which I get the feeling we're doing at the moment? No, I certainly wouldn't characterise it as hoping, to the, hoping for the best. I think we have a realistic programme from the contractor that has been analysed in great detail. I mean, obviously, we were as concerned as, as, as everyone was when the, when the date had to change. Now, if you change a date, you want to make sure that you're changing it to something that's realistic and is achievable. Um, I, I think for, I, I can say from a personal, it was quite a painful process mm -hmm. going through the, the change in the date, uh, and rightly so, because if you are going to change a date on something as fundamental as this, you ought to be absolutely certain that you're changing it on the best data you can possibly have. Um, we've now got four and a half years of extremely good data of exactly what we've experienced in this location doing this type of work. So I think we've taken into account everything we possibly can take into account in terms of what, what can be done going, going forward. Um, in terms of guaranteeing it, no, we cannot guarantee it. But by the same token, we're not saying this is absolutely the best we can do either. I think it's, it's a realistic uh, date going forward. The contractor has looked at it in great detail and it's, it's, it's the right way to go forward. Okay, thank you. I'd like to just... Uh I have a brief uh, question to you on health and safety on site. Uh, I was wondering if, if you could update us on progress of uh, investigations into the, the tragedy of, of early in the year and also just in general uh, an assessment of health and safety and any uh, changes or developments that have happened since then. Certainly. Um, obviously the, the, the tragic fatal accident in, in April was uh, a great shock to the project. Um, and a great, a great setback to us all. We, we, it was one thing we were focused on. We wanted to have a, a very safe project with, with nobody being, being killed on the project. That was absolutely our fundamental requirement. Um, what has happened since then is the health and safety executive are still investigating. Um, these things do tend to be fairly drawn out in that they want to talk to everybody who is in the vicinity at the time, make sure they have got all the information they can possibly gather. Um, what's, even, though they did, even though the investigation is ongoing, um, I think what is important to emphasise is that in the very early stages, the first thing they focus on is are there some fundamental flaws in the health and safety culture or health and safety management or health and safety processes on the site? Because if there are, then they would put uh, measures into place very quickly to make sure that those were dealt with. And that could be something such as, such as a, a prohibition order, a stop work order or something like that. Um, that did not happen. On, on this job. They, they came in, they looked at the, the procedures, the management, the processes, and were satisfied that they were all correct and were, were all in place. Um, regrettably, even with all those things in place, tra tragic accidents can still happen. There's always a human element. But obviously, I can't speculate on the final outcome of the health and safety investigation. But um, the, I suppose the most troubling part of it in terms of, of my view of it and the, and the FCBC project director's view of it was we take on so many big risks and big challenges in doing a job of this size and those are all deeply analysed, a lot of preparation and work goes into them uh, to make sure that nothing like this can happen and that's, that's a real focus. Um, the activity that was going on with the fatality occurred, it was a routine bit of maintenance on a bit of plant that could have been in use on any work construction site around the UK. And that was, I think, the, the biggest frustration to us, that it, was, it, was not, it, was, it wasn't a big thing that was directly related to the construction. Um, and regrettably within our industry, that is very often the case, that it's the, it's the everyday mundane things that, that, that come and bite you. And that's, that's deeply regrettable, I think, to, to our whole industry, um, but something we're, we're very conscious of. In terms of has anything specifically changed, uh, no, it hasn't, um, because of the issues, because of the, the points I've raised, there was nothing fundamentally identified as being wrong. Obviously, we do look very hard at all our activities all the time, and we'll continue to do so. 
Um, but Michael Martin, the project director, is very clear about it. Safety is his number one priority. He reinforces that to every new starter on the project and to every activity that we do. And that will continue to be the case until we finish. And obviously, we have to be very, very careful about complacency or getting close to the end and people taking their eye off the ball. That's mm -hmm. extremely important. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we've got some questions now on community engagement. R Richard, you're yeah, going to lead on that. Um, again, uh, good morning, Mr. Clayman. Can I uh, turn to the fact of the community engagement? I know you've, you've said that you're uh, involved in school children, uh, um, basically putting drones up, letting people see on, on, on the internet, etc. What how you're doing. Uh, I, I've also, as I said earlier, got a major road uh, work done in my constituency, the M8, M74, and quite a lot of concerns from businesses and local residents in regard to road closures and different other things, sound baffling, uh, fencing. Um, can you tell me what you're actually doing? Can you give us an update on any new issues of concern that have been raised with you by local residents or businesses and how you're tackling them in the, uh, over the last six months? Yeah, um, I think uh, as the project's uh, continued, community relations have actually got better and better as we've got through the project. I think at the beginning, um, when you start out on site, there's a lot of... Um, concern from the local residents in particular about what's going to happen, the impact that the works are going to have um, on the com local communities. So um, right back at the bill stage and before the bill stage of the, of the project, um, we engage with the local communities, the community councils and the local authorities in particular um, to try and build consensus as much as we possibly could. We built um, a lot of good feeling and goodwill, I think, through developing the, the code of construction practice, which is basically the, con the contractor's Bible. Um, if you don't know, that sets the, the limits for noise, um, vehicle routing, prohibited routes, um, working hours, all these kind of things. It's a very public document, so the public know exactly what um, we should be doing as uh, the monitors of the project. Um, so. In particular, the community forums have been set up. They've been running every three months through the project. Um, we, we tell the, the, the community, uh, people from the community, what we've been doing over the last period, um, show them graphic images of, of the works in progress to explain what's happening. And very importantly, we talk about what's going to happen in the next three months or into, into the future, so that there's basically no surprises or we try to, to limit disruption as much as possible. Um, that kind of thing. So, so coming to, to your, your question, more recent um, issues have focused around um, traffic management changes, what impacts they might have on the, the travelling public, both on the strategic road network. Um, the last couple of weekends, for example, we've put overhead gantries, the intelligent transport system gantries in place around the Scotston Junction on the south side of the project. Um, people were well informed at community level and at national level on the road network, we advertised uh, those works on the gantry network so that people were aware of the works that were going to happen. Did the works during the middle of the night to, to um, minimise the disruption to the travelling public. And of course, we talked about that at the community forums as well. So that's one example of trying to tell people about what we're going to do and then realising those works in the, in the best possible manner to, to minimise disruption. Um, I think we've, we've dealt with a, a huge number of issues over the last five years, I suppose. Um, and those, those issues have varied. Um, at the beginning, there was concerns about the site set up, um, that kind of thing, um, making sure that um, the local communities were kept quiet and noise-free as much as possible, that we minimised dust um, and uh, dirt on the roads, things like that. So we were very vigilant looking at um, the, the various issues raised there and trying to, to stave them off as much, much as we possibly could before they occurred. Um, and then in more recent times, we're looking at the more practical operation of the, of the, the road network. For example, uh, Queensbury uh, District Community Council recently were concerned about how the new road at the Queensbury Junction was going to operate in comparison with the existing road set up. And I think I was able to... Um, try and minimise their concerns as much as possible until the road actually opens. It's very difficult to know exactly how the road will perform, but there's a lot of new engineering built into the road network, particularly the, the intelligent transport system, for example, to try and control traffic and smooth the flow out and minimise disruption as much as possible. We have um, roads designed to the, the appropriate design standards, that kind of thing. Um, 
the other strand of what we do is um, very much focused on the education aspects, which David mentioned earlier. Um, the Contact and Education Centre, which is actually also part of the scheme costs as well, uh, that building was part of the, of the project cost, um, was established um, back in uh, January 2013. And as David said, we've had around 15,000 pupils come through um, learning about bridge engineering, um, science, technology, uh, maths, those sorts of subjects, pupils of all different um, age ranges. Um, the last three years, and we certainly did it um, very recently, we wrote to every school in Scotland to invite them to come to the, the, the premises to take part in those activities. And I think we're, we're pretty well booked all the way through this next academic year. And we have a lot of repeat visitors from, from schools as well. And if you remember back in, I think, October last year, um, the Cabinet Secretary came to celebrate the 10,000th pupil actually visiting the, the contact centre. So that's a, a really good way of, of educating people about engineering and, and, and not just the, the hard engineering side of things, looking out of the window and seeing the three bridges, but the wider maths and science and technology side of things. So hopefully that will spur people on to, to take up those sort of subjects in the future. Then we have a lot of interest from around the world, other parts of the UK, a lot of engineering in interest, obviously, but we get groups of all different persuasions, um, whether they're scout groups, whether they're um, uh, probus clubs. So we, we have a, a very high demand for not only uh, uh, site visits and, and site presentations in the contact centre, but we also send members of the team out um, elsewhere in Scotland and around the UK to do presentations and conferences and to try and spread some of the lessons that we've learnt uh, around, uh, um, on the project around the country. Taking on board all the things that you're, you're, you're doing and the costs and the, and the contract, etc., have you given the commitment that after the contract uh, has been done that you will go back and recheck uh, in particular traffic noise and given the commitment that if so required, you will put up fencing to cover that, and there's a reason why I'm asking that question. Yeah. There's, um, the, the noise, there's the noise regulations which require us to go back and um, do a, um, a check on the, the actual noise levels one year after opening, I think five years after opening, 10 years and 15 years after opening, to, to do a check to see that what we actually predicted at the beginning of the, of the project and what was basically taken forward through the bill process um, is actually what's delivered in terms of all the mitigation um, that's been put in place in terms of your noise barriers and earth buns that you mentioned before. So we have to do a check on that. Um, and you know, if, if the, the measures don't add up, then we have to do something about that, either in terms of um, putting in noise insulation or perhaps building more buns and, and noise barriers. But that's normally fairly unusual. Um, hopefully the, the sums have, have been... Uh, properly addressed during the, the design phase and the assumptions made are, are borne out in, in the future. Um, so, so there is a mechanism to, to monitor uh, noise through the next 15 years of operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. I was, I was worried we might be getting on to another traffic scheme, which I'm glad we're not going to. John, I think you were going to uh, ask some questions about uh, transport strategy. Hey, thank you, Kavina. Hey, good morning and, and thanks for your briefing. Um, as, as we've heard, the, the project certainly more than the construction, the excellent construction work that's ongoing, and, and part of that is the public transport strategy. Now, you've alluded to that in your response, uh, Mr. Klein, but it, it's, it's very similar to what we heard last time. Now, I appreciate that um, there's a lot of people involved in it. There's the, the, the various councils, there's Transport Scotland, and, and indeed that your meetings are biannual, with the next one scheduled for autumn. I'm always that wee bit suspicious when it's a seasonal day rather than a, a month or a, or a particular week. Are you able to give some outline as to what's happened in the interim period since you were last here with regard to public transport? Because it's important that this investment isn't simply for car users, that the that public transport users benefit as well. Sure. Thank you. That's true. And I think what, one thing I want to emphasise is that this, this part of the public transport strategy specifically relates to the projects, the FRC project. And obviously that's the use of the existing Forth Road Bridge going forward. And one thing that's been, that's been going on in the, in the past few months is that we've actually gone out to consultation in terms of the traffic that will be able to use the fourth road bridge under the, the new road orders once the Queen's Ferry crossing is opened. So we've, we've gone into clarification in terms of, um, obviously, the, the, the intention is it should be a public transport corridor um, for basically um, buses, 
um, taxis, pedestrians, cyclists, and certain categories of motorcyclists. And particularly on the, on the motorcyclist issue, there was a, a, a question raised there, where there seemed to be a, a slight gap in, in which motorcyclists could use the Queensferry Crossing and which would be able to use the Fourth Road Bridge. And that was drawn to our attention by uh, some of the motorcycling um, uh, groups. And that was very helpful in us being able to, in, to evol evolve the, the uh, traffic orders so that now when we've gone out to consultation, we've been able to make sure that that gap no longer exists. So, Every, everyone on a motorcycle will be able to use either one crossing or the other. There's no one who will, will not be able to use it. So that, that, that consultation has, has been completed. We've had comments back on it, and that's, that's progressing extremely well. So I think in terms of the, the, the specific project-related activities, those have made some significant progress over the past few months. In terms of the wider public transport strategy, I think I'll let Lawrence uh, talk about that. Yes. Um, as you say, we're basically the, the public transport strategy working group, which was formed um, some five maybe six years ago now, um, and is a, is a, a meeting of the local um, transport authorities, regional transport authority, um, and the bus operating companies, and, and latterly um, rail as well. Um, and we've, as part of the project, we, we, we tried to implement as many public transport measures as we possibly could when we were actually um, developing the, the contracts. So, I don't know whether you're aware that we in incorporated a bus hard shoulder running scheme within the Fife ITS contract and within the Junction 1A contract, and they've been operational for uh, three years now, and they're used by around 10 to 12 buses every morning to try and jump uh, the queues, um, which, which uh, result normally from the, from the fourth row bridge. So they've been largely successful so far, and obviously we won't realise all the benefits of the public transport corridor that we're providing until the whole project is complete. Um, we, we've also um, undertaken, or we're in the middle of undertaking, some improvement works at Ferry Toll Park and Ride. Um, there's actually a, a temporary setup at the moment while construction works are ongoing there, and that's uh, part of the, the main contract um, to increase the circulatory area for buses and separate the entrances and exits for, for buses and the, the, the motor cars to make it much more, um, to work much more efficiently. And there are also bus priority measures into and out of the park and ride around the new ferry toll junction. So that a lot of those measures have already been incorporated into the project. And um, obviously having the fourth row bridge as a public transport corridor, we were trying to make the, the most of that during the design phase and worked with the public transport working group colleagues to, to incorporate into the project these public transport link roads on the south side of the fourth um, road bridge, which link seamlessly into the existing uh, bus lane on the A90 into Edinburgh. So when the whole project is, is open, um, you'll be able to either park at the Halbeath Park and Ride, which was opened around three years ago, and I think the, the patronage there is, is increasing all the time. You can get on a bus there, uh, use the, the bus hard shoulder running if it's in the peak period, uh, facility through the M90 in Fife. The buses, nearly all of them stop, if I think all of them do actually stop at a ferry toll park and ride, pick up more passengers there, seamlessly across the fourth road bridge and use the public transport um, uh, links into the bus lanes all the way through to, to Barnton. So we've, we've tried to, to optimise as much as we can in terms of bus traffic. Um, the group looking forward is looking at further improvements on the route corridor which would re be realised out with um, the project team as such. Um, and the, the most recent focus has been on the Newbridge Junction, which is right at the very south end of our road corridor, and seeing what improvements can be made to help bus circulation in particular around that junction and on its approaches. And that uh, there's a, been a report jointly produced by um, Edinburgh Council, uh, or jointly funded, I should say, by um, City of Edinburgh Council, West Lothian Council and Transport Scotland um, to see what the best measures are to take forward. And I think that will be the, the focus of the next public transport working group meeting. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just to confirm, that both the councils mentioned are on the south side of the bridge. I, I take it there's engagement with Fife Council as well? Very much so, yes. Uh, and, and the role of Transport Scotland, is that an overarching one, given that, and I'm delighted that Newbridge is considered there, because it shows that the effects of, of the improvements that are going to take place yes. are going to impact way beyond. So, you know, no point improving something if it just creates a log jam That's elsewhere. Right. I think, I mean, just to give you an example, on the north side, um, the, the park and ride site at Halbeath 
was promoted by Fife Council, but the funding um, eventually, I think the vast majority of that funding actually came from Scottish Government via um, the intervention of Transport Scotland. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, Peter, I think you've got to... Thanks, thanks convener. Thanks for, uh, for a very uh, a good update on where we are. I would, I would like to ask a wee bit more about the, the old bridge. And, uh, you know, you mentioned it just now, but, I mean, it's going to be buses, uh, taxis and uh, motorcycles, and that's it as far as the old bridge is concerned. It seems to me that there's going to be a huge cost to upkeep that, that structure for a very limited use. Is, is there not, no more we could do with that old bridge? I mean, I'm saying it's an old bridge. It's only 50 years old, I believe. Uh, it seems a very limited use, uh, and there's going to be an upkeep cost, and I just feel that maybe we, we should look at that again and, and take some, some pressure off the, the new bridge, because, uh, you know, in my experience across on that bridge on a regular basis, uh, there are queues morning and night. Uh, are you telling me that there won't be queues on the new bridge morning and night? And, uh, and uh, if so, can we do more with the old bridge is, is my question, really. I think that's a good point. And I think the, the, the fourth road bridge, I mean, we have to remember at the very start of this uh, project that the thought was that the fourth road bridge would not be able to be used for anything at all uh, in the fact that the cables were going to continue to deteriorate. Mm. Obviously, the installation of the dehumidification equipment has been very successful in um, slowing down or stopping altogether the corrosion in the cables. Um, fairly early on in the, in the project, we were able to develop what we called the managed crossing strategy, which started using the fourth road bridge as a public transport corridor. So that started to use it for, for some things, and obviously that um, could be developed further in the future. In terms of the managed crossing strategy, we've already looked at the, the potential to put a light rail system. I hesitate to use the word tram, but uh, something <laughs> like that, perhaps, <laughs> across the fourth road bridge. Um, but. Certainly, I think once you take the heavy goods vehicles off the fourth road bridge, that's the key in terms of the, the, the longevity of the fourth road bridge. It, it also has the other benefit of any maintenance that's required to be done on the bridge. Obviously, it's a great deal simpler if you have far less traffic on it, and you can put the traffic onto one carriageway and carry out the maintenance on the other carriageway. Mm -hmm. So it can make what the maintenance that does need to be done um, quicker and cheaper in terms of actually doing the maintenance. But I think in terms of how the bridge might be used in the future, that's, uh, that's, that's probably for others to decide out with uh, this particular project. Mm. But um, it, the fourth road bridge is going to be there. Um, it's going to be ma maintained. And who, who knows what it might be used for in the future. Um, transport modes generally may change dramatically in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, I really don't know. Um, but it, it's, it's going to be there. It's certainly going to be usable. And if, if it was, were to be re re revisited in the future as to how it might be used, that's certainly possible. Yes. Just to carry on from that, I mean, as I said, I think the, the old bridge is something about 50 years old, only 50 years old. You know, it, it, it's a very short lifespan. What is the lifespan for the new bridge? What, what do you, how long is that going to be fully usable? Well, it has a design life of 120, 100, 120 years. 120 years, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and probably we should always remember, I mean, we've got the, the classic um, structure of the fourth, the fourth bridge there. It's already 126, 126, 126 127 years old, yeah. and it's still functioning very well, yeah. carrying everything that um, it needs to carry. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, that sets us a very good example of, of how we should be designing and what we should be designing. Um, perhaps we should also remember that at the time that was designed, uh, it was shortly after the Tay Bridge disaster. So obviously that was in their minds when they designed the, the, the fourth bridge. So there has to be a balance, I think, between you know, designing something for an infinite design life and designing it for a reasonable design life. But the Queensferry Crossing is designed for 120 years. Uh, I hasten to say that doesn't mean it has to close on 120 years plus one day. Mm. Uh, so that's the, the design life which it's, it's, it's expected to last for. I think what, what, um, what we've done with the Queensferry Crossing is we've, we've really considered maintenance and operation in a lot of detail um, at the planning stages. So we've built in ease of maintenance and ease of operation so, um, and also health and safety as well so that if someone needs to inspect any part of the bridge, uh, the inside workings of the bridge, inside the towers to check the cable stay anchorages and that kind of thing, they can access the bridge by going through the deck, not actually having to stop on the hard shoulder on the deck and walk mm. across to the towers. So there's a lot of um, uh, actual physical um, uh, facilities built into to the bridge itself, access the bridge through the, the two abutments at either end. Um, there's a lot of 
health monitoring systems, as we call them, which are actually being retrofitted to some extent on the fourth road bridge to monitor how it's performing. Well, those will be installed from day one on the, the new Queensferry crossing. So we'll be able to look and see how the bridge is actually performing um, in real time as it mm. goes through um, its, its design life and beyond, hopefully. But I mean, the thing, the problem with the old bridge is the cable. I mean, you've still got miles of cable in the new bridge. What's different about the, the cable in this time from last time round? If, if, if this one will do 120 and the old, the old one only the, did 50? The beauty with uh, the, the Queensbury crossing is, is that the cables can, can be replaced without disrupting the traffic. Yeah. Um, the cables themselves, and when you come to site, hopefully you, you'll, be, you'll be able to see what the, the, the cables are made up of, but they have individual strands within them and the, the number of individual strands within each of those cables, the white cables that you see um, as you go past the bridge, varies depending on where you are um, in relation to the towers. So the, the, the cables closest to the towers tend to have more of these strands in than the ones further away. And not only can you replace a whole cable, but you can replace individual strands by pulling them through into the bridge deck or into the towers. Mm -hmm. So they can be replaced um, at any time in the future with minimal disruption. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Richard, you've got a small it's question. Small, Richard. just to follow on for that, and I agree with Peter Chapman. Um, Golden Gate Bridge, nearly 100 years old. Fourth Road Bridge, 50, just over 50. Queen's Ferry Crossing. You've answered the question I was going to ask. But in, in regards to what Peter was asking, could you recable the old fourth, the, the, let's say the fourth, the, the fourth Road Bridge? Could you recable it? once there's hardly any traffic on it for future posterity? In theory, yes, it could be done. Um, basically, what you would need to do is you'd have to completely construct a new cable above the existing cable, um, and then what you would do is you would transfer the load from the old cable onto the new cable. So it, it can be done. Um, it's obviously a very difficult process to do it, but it's easier when you have less traffic underneath. Yeah. Obviously, that's the, that yeah. was the key, and that was the main objection to trying to replace the cable on the fourth road bridge rather than build an entirely the, new crossing. The new bridge, has, has, as you say, has cables going down, individual cables and, yep. and individualised cables, yeah. whereas the old bridge has basically a, 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 a wraparound sort of main cable. Mm. Um, but if we could, we could, we could do that if we were so minded. If we were minded to, it could be done, uh, but it's an extremely difficult process. Uh, to, technically, it's possible, um, but it's, uh, not, as an engineer, it's not something I would recommend. But it could be done. Thank you. Thank you Richard. Uh, Mike, have, uh, as a quick one, please. Question following on from Peter's questions to you. I just wanted to check if, in future, the political decision is made to actually utilise the current bridge for traffic if the uh, future use of the new bridge uh, is full of traffic. So I just wanted to confirm with you a simple question, really, that the design of the approach roads uh, to, the bridge, to the bridge would be... It's not going to be a problem, is it, to transfer traffic from the new bridge to the old bridge if that's what a future government wanted to do? It's, it's possible to do it. It's, it's, it's not a case of you can say that you can switch. Um, the, the, the new Queen's Crossing would be a motorway running at 70 miles mm -hmm. an hour you'd not be able to run 70 miles an hour all the traffic that's on the Queensferry Crossing onto the fourth road bridge. That's clearly not, not practical in terms of connecting roads. What you can do is if you want to put more traffic onto the fourth road bridge, yes, there are connecting roads at both ends. There are. That will work. There are. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, David, just, just to follow up slightly on that, if I may. Uh, obviously, when, it, when it's windy, we, we notice uh, the restrictions on the... the I'm, I'm going to join with everyone because I'm over 50 here, not so old bridge, um, and, and say that we might have to divert buses from that bridge to the new bridge uh, in, during incredible w windy periods. That, that's going to be a seamless transition which will just happen through, through gantry signs and there will be no issues with it. It's designed to be a very smooth transition, and if, if buses need to use the Queensferry Crossing, they will be able to very easily, yes. Okay. And it, it is literally flicking a switch on a sign to tell them to go the, the, the other route, yes. Okay. Now, I th we've got another section that we'd like just to uh, lead off on, which is with, with to actual the workforce. Uh, Marie, would you like to lead on that, please? Yeah, and I would just say it's just been fascinating listening to you so far this morning because I think it's just an incredible engineering project and just hearing the detail of it and it was 
fortunate enough to visit uh, a similar structure in Mio, the viaduct there. And uh, yeah, so it'll be, uh, yeah, it's just a really interesting project. But really, it was just in terms of the workforce, really, because I think when we have, uh, you know, something of this scale and size, uh, I, I just think that you know the trainees and the apprentices that it would take, that's a, a, a vitally important part of it. So it was really just uh, wanting to know uh, what's been happening around that and what are the current numbers of trainees and apprentices uh, that are involved in the project. Um, no, I think you're, you're right. It's, it's vitally important that we take the opportunity to um, maximise the training that we can get out of this. Um, I think Lawrence touched on it earlier on in terms of um, getting young engineers encouraged mm -hmm. and. Uh, being able to take over from us in the future. I want, I want people to be as enthusiastic about future projects as, as we are about this one. It's, it's vitally important. And if you catch them young, that's absolutely the best time to do it. But in, in, in terms of the workforce uh, and, and the training in particular, um, we did build in some uh, requirements within the contract itself to try to encourage these areas. And the specific areas we, we, we focused on. So we, we said that in the principal contract, which is the one that FCBC are constructing, we wanted them to deliver an annual average of 45 vocational training positions, uh, 21 professional body training places, and 46 positions for the long-term unemployed. And that was an annual average each year through the construction period. And those numbers, we actually started off with lower numbers than that, and FCBC volunteered these higher numbers as part of their winning tender. So that's what set the, the bar in terms of what, what needed to be achieved. Um, what we've managed to date is that um, the Cumulative annual average on vocational training is 111 per year in t against a target of, of 45. In terms of professional training, the current cum cumulative annual average is 32 compared to our target of 21. And in the long-term unemployed, our cumulative annual average is 49 compared to the minimum requirement of 46. So each year we've achieved or bettered the target for the year. In terms of apprentices, and they come into the vocational training category um, and, under the SVQ system, um, we've had uh, to, do, to, to date, I think, a total of, of 20 apprentices have gone through the system. We currently have 12 still with us working on the project. Um, of those, um, eight, are, eight are working with, um, are, are from Fife, Lothian or Edinburgh, and four are from elsewhere in central Scotland. Uh, the, in areas such as civil engineering technicians, electricians, a welder and fabricator, and business administrators. And of those who have finished their uh, apprenticeships with us, two of them have gone on to full-time employment with FCBC on the project. So a lot of, of time and effort has gone into uh, the training overall. In addition to that, uh, we've had um, 15 members of, of our team, that's the employer's delivery team, have become chartered engineers while on the FRC project. So they've gone through their, their three to four year training period and become uh, fully qualified chartered engineers. And also we've had uh, summer students working with us uh, from various un um, uh, universities around Scotland. Um, in, um, they've come from Edinburgh University, Aberdeen, Abertay, uh, Cambridge, Strathclyde, Heriot Watt, uh, Bristol and Dundee. So we've covered quite a wide range of, of university placements as well working with us. So I think overall there's been a, a lot of effort has gone into uh, as much training as we possibly can throughout the period. Um, overall in the project we've averaged, as I said, about just under 1,200 people working on the project at any given time. Of those people, uh, about 46% of them have home addresses in Edinburgh, Lothian and Fife, and 40% have home addresses elsewhere in Scotland. So although it is quite an international project, I think we've had 23 different nationalities working on the project. A lot of them are actually local people as well. No, that's great. Uh, yeah, it was just to say that that was really going to be my next question, was what the, the local uh, element of that would have been. So, no, thanks for that information. Uh, Gail. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, and thanks very much. Like, Mari, I've just found the whole thing absolutely fascinating. And uh, I just want to say that the bridge looks absolutely beautiful. And I was really struck by um, the picture that you had with three bridges from space. I think it's just fantastic. And it really is going to be an iconic scene in Scotland. And it's such a major infrastructure project. I mean, I don't know what the last one was of such a, a scale. And I think as well, um, touching on what you said about apprenticeships and trainees, that's also the advantage of having such a big project that takes such a long time to, to complete, is that you can have people actually getting qualifications on the job, which is amazing. Um, I just wanted to touch on the kind of community side. 
uh, the, the public engagement, the schools engagement, which I think is absolutely vital. Um, really pleased that you've uh, made contact with all schools in Scotland, um, because although it is a project that's uh, very relevant to this area, you know, it, it's relevant to the whole country. Um, and I, coming from WIC, I think it's probably um, correct to say that, that schools in the constituency of Caden, Sutherland and Ross would probably find it a lot more difficult to, to do a site visit than, than ones more locally would. Um, but I noticed that you had um, a little bit in your project update about the National Women in Engineering Day. And I know that um, certainly locally we've had quite a drive uh, to try and encourage more women into the STEM subjects uh, through school and then uh, onwards as well. I wonder if you could tell me um, how many women you have actually working on site on the project. If you can't tell me that, maybe you could get back to me. <laughs> Um, and also, um, I was really quite touched to see the, the involvement of the veterans that built the other bridge as well. I thought that was fantastic. So I just wanted um, to essentially congratulate you on your level of community engagement. I think it's been fantastic. Um, and if you can get back to me with the gender split, I would be very grateful. Thank you. I think it's despite all the wealth of information I have here, that's one area I haven't covered. So I'll, I'll need to come back to you with, with, with detail on that, yes. Okay. Um, but I think to pick up your point on the, on the veterans, um, I think it's, it's something we'd, we engage with them quite early on, actually. And the, the level of interest and fascinating stories that they have is just incredible. Mm -hmm. And we've actually, I think we've had three visits for them so far during the, the duration of the project. And uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's really fascinating for our younger engineers as well to engage with them yeah. and just hear how much things have changed in the, the 50 plus years since the, the fourth road bridge was, was constructed. Um, I think that's in terms of health and safety and issues like that. It's, it's such a, it's like <laughs> night and day. It really is in, in terms of just how things are dealt with and, and um, some things do change and some don't. The, the engineering principles of the construction don't change. They're, they're still exactly the same. But it's fascinating to just hear that, that, that side of the story too. Right, I think you had a question on. Yes, <coughs> so, um, thank you. Um, can I ask about um, blacklisting? You'd given an insurance to keep a watching brief on this. Can I ask what steps you've taken to monitor this? What action you've maybe taken as well? It's something that we, we certainly take very seriously. FCBC takes very seriously as well. Um, and it's something that I, I challenge FCBC on on a regular basis. Um, I asked the project director, has there ever been any question of it? Is there any, has any issues been raised about it either to, to FCBC? And no issues have been raised to FCBC on the subject. Um, and no companies that are involved with the project have ever indulged in blacklisting uh, for this project. And I have received that reassurance again this week from the FCBC project director. So he's categorically stated that no one involved in the FRC project is, is, has anything to do with blacklisting. It's completely unacceptable. Okay, is, if, is there a way for um, a worker or a potential worker who feels they have been blacklisted um, to raise that directly and have that investigated? There is, yes. Well, we have a, a whistleblowing policy on, on, this, on the project, um, which is uh, both the, the parent companies of FCBC have their own individual company um, hotlines and uh, ways of contacting them, but there's also a whistleblower policy on the site which is put forward and uh, made known to people when they come for their initial site induction on the project. So yes, there is a, 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 an avenue where a whistleblower could contact uh, um, a confidential helpline to flag up any concerns that they might have. Okay. What about somebody who feels that they haven't been employed on the project because they have been blacklisted previously from a company involved? Is there a way for them to flag that up to yourselves? Well, I think, I think if there were to be someone in that position, um, I, would, I would ask them to contact Transport Scotland and let us know. Um, and we'd certainly investigate thoroughly. But to date, we've had, had no approach on that subject. But if anyone feels they are in that position, if they would contact us at Transport Scotland, we have an inquiries line where they can contact us and it will be thoroughly investigated. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have one further question which you perhaps could enlighten me. When I was going through the previous papers, I noticed that there was an incident where some concrete was allowed to slip into uh, the sea below the crossing. Um, I couldn't find the results of the investigation into that, and I couldn't find uh, the results to what remedial action had been taken uh, in relation to this incident. Perhaps you could just uh, enlighten me. 
Certainly, yeah. First, first of all, can I clarify, it was an alleged incident which took place. Um, we were notified of it two months after it allegedly happened, uh, which of course does make it quite difficult to actually investigate. Um, if someone had been that concerned about it, the way to do it would have been to flag it up immediately at the time, when obviously something can be investigated in detail. Um, we were first made aware of it, regrettably through the press, two months after it had allegedly happened. Um, there was a wildly exaggerated claim that several hundred tonnes of concrete had been dumped into the fourth. Um, a, physically that isn't possible with the logistics that we have on the site, delivering all the concrete via barges. That would have meant we'd have to have, uh, have two barges completely full of concrete dumped into the fourth. Well, a, that's a very stupid thing to do commercially. Uh, we've got far better things to do with our concrete. Um, and it, it just isn't something that the contractor would do. Um, it would be very visible for miles if that amount of concrete had been put into the fourth. Um, the investigation did take place. Um, what appears to have happened is that was, there was a concrete pour had taken place and there was some cleaning out of the lines being done after the concrete pour had been completed. Normally that material is retained within um, basins within the barge itself. For some reason, at the very end, the hose was put over the side and therefore there was some discoloured water that was discharged into the fourth itself. Um, SEPA were fully involved with our investigation on this. We, we took them through exactly what had happened. We also, just to confirm, to have a very detailed log of all the concrete that's batched on the site, because we batch all our concrete on the site, and you want to know where every cubic metre of that concrete has gone. So we have a complete log that we can track of if 50 cubic metres of concrete has been batched, we know exactly where that 50, concrete meet, 50 cubic metres of concrete has gone on the site. So we back check, check through that as well to make sure that every cubic metre of concrete was accounted for, and it was. So we completed the investigation, we rebriefed all the crews, because it's still not acceptable to, for, for washout to be going into the fourth either, that, that is not acceptable. Um, so the crews were fully rebriefed on the subject, and we, we closed out the matter with SEPA on that basis. Okay, thank you. That's some reassurance because I think when I was reading back at some stage it was mentioned it was 348 tonnes and I think that if that had been a decrease from, from a, an incredibly large amount which I don't think even I could have missed not being there. So I'm, d I'm delighted that it, it appears not to be the incident it was and thank you for updating us on that. Are there any other questions that the committee would like to ask? Well, could I just say, David and Lawrence, thank you very much for coming to the committee. Um, we are going to have a discussion, uh, an informal discussion in the committee about coming out to visit. Um, and I know some people are looking forward to that more than me. I'm terrified of heights. So I shall be staying in the middle of the bridge and I won't be going out to the end of a cantilever because it just terrifies me. But we, are, we have got a date, I think, and we're going to see if we can do that. And we are going to ask you to come back again, I think, in December to give us an update on how things are progressing. And there is always the opportunity that if you feel there's something important that should be brought before the committee to, to let us know, because I think it's important. It's a, a, a two-way process. Absolutely. So yeah. thank you very much for coming in and thank you for the evidence that you've given. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you on the, on the project site. Thank you. Good. Sorry. OK, I, and now I, I have to, I'm told, formally close the meeting so that the meeting is formally closed, but I would ask the committee just to stay in place so we can have a quick discussion afterwards. Thank you.